Ensilica listed on the stock exchange in May 2022, and for that, it was awarded IPO of the year. We'll roll on to the end of 2023. The company's raised one and a half million pounds. So what are the proceeds being used for? To answer that and more questions, I'm delighted to be joined by Executive Chairman Mark Hodgkin. So, Mark, we're going to hear the acronym ASIC a lot in our conversation, short for Application Specific Integrated Circuit. So what do they do? Who needs them? And what problems do they solve? So they do a number of things. Um, they differentiate a customer's product from his competitor's product. Um, they can be designed to be extremely low power. Um, they can give additional functionality, all to make your product that in, has a chip in it different to your competitor's products. That, that's the key thing. Um, and they also allow you to uh, secure your supply chain because you're not buying chips off the shelf. You're buying uh, the, the chips that you've ordered for yourself. So you, you get your own space at the foundry um, and, it, and it improves uh, supply chains. And it also protects your intellectual property rights to some extent because you can uh, put your uh, know-how into the chip, which is very difficult to reverse engineer. So that's that's the key. What a, a application-specific integrated circuit does, and why you would want to why why you'd want to have one. Okay, that's quite a mouthful. But what is the market like? The customer base, you know, recent contract wins suggest that the market is growing. It is. I think, you know, people are starting to use ASICs more because they want to differentiate their products, as I've just been saying. But also there are drivers coming from uh, from government, uh, cyber security uh, legislation, particularly in Europe, but going to follow in the UK and, uh, and in the United States are driving uh, companies to change their, their, their the current ASICs they've got. So there's more cyber security. And we're seeing also, particularly in the industrial space, um, the advent and the, the serious coming now of uh, AI uh, is, is beginning to impact how they want their machines to work. And so there needs to be inter interfaces between, you know, their controller and AI. And we, we are going to see some benefit ourselves from, from designing those facilities into, into, into re renewed and revived ASICs. So there the are two big drivers there, as well as just the, the, the wider driver is people are using more electronic gadgets. Customers want more functionality. Custom, um, suppliers want to have uh, changes to their to their to their products. So just pl plenty of demand. Plenty of demand. So plenty of demand. Therefore, plenty of opportunity. So I'm wondering how you are expanding the business. You're d developing and growing those markets you've just referenced because I can see that some existing clients are renewing, but how are you engaging with prospective customers? Is that what the raise was all about? The, the raise was about uh, growth capital. Um, we've got five or six really interesting opportunities before us, uh, which we can execute, but there's the things we'd like to do a little bit more of and a little bit uh, more, invest a little bit more. Uh, and, and that's why we went out to the market to raise some more capital because we've got these opportunities. We've got um, two big opportunities in, uh, for new ASICs where we have previous experience working with other companies and uh, competitors want their own chip. We've, we've, we've recently been uh, given the status as a value added, uh, value, sorry, value chain aggregator uh, for a major global foundry. And that is generating new work both in the United States of America and in Europe, and we needed a bit more capital to support that initiative, which is we think is going to be very large. Uh, we've got our own chip in the healthcare sector, which we'd like to invest some more in. Um, we don't have to do it, but we'd like to do it. And we're getting some very strong uh, interest in our traditional consultancy business for the application of our skills for large tier one automotives as well. So we've got a huge amount of uh, opportunity before us. And we just we, we wanted to you know invest some more really so that hence hence the raise. However, the share price is not reflecting the initiatives and the opportunities, the contract wins and contract renewals. You know how exasperated are you by this? <laughs> well, but we're very exasperated. Um, we've met our market expectations now since IPO. Uh, we've had a constant stream of good news. 
Um, uh, this was a raise for new new money for good news, uh, and um, you know it's disappointing to see the share price fall so much as it has done in the last couple of months, uh, which we don't think is warranted. But you know, chairman of small listed companies never think the sh share price going down is warranted, do they? But um, you know, it's it's exasperating, um, and uh, looking forward to the time when the markets are a bit more accommodating uh, and have a bit more faith in the future, which. They clearly don't have that much faith in, in the future economy just at the moment, or at least doesn't seem so. So talk to me about the most recent numbers, the most recent trading update. Is the business profitable yet, or are investors backing a company at R&D phase, or one that's in transition, in a hybrid state? So we are a business in transition but we've been in transition since, since 2016 when we converted from being a consultancy business to being a fabulous semiconductor manufacturing business um, but we're right at the end of that transition now and we've got three of uh, three ASICs in production and generating uh, revenues we've got six others on the track to becoming uh, gen uh, revenue generating ASICs so we're well on the way uh, to complete the transition we are profitable. We were profitable uh, in 2023, uh, which is a May year end, uh, which is what we said we would be. And we're currently trading in line with market expectations, uh, and we intend uh, to, to meet those. And we think we can meet those. Uh, so May 24, we will once again post uh, numbers that are in line with our market expectations. But we'll, we'll be up on last year by maybe. Uh, I think. I think from memory that. The expectations are 11 percent higher this year than last year but the other thing is as we grow and as these opportunities develop we we're increasingly seeing good visibility on on further out we, we haven't got firm orders for 25 well we've got some firm orders for 25 but we, we've got more visibility for 25 and beyond which is all very encouraging for us and this raise was about underwriting really the growth in 26 and 27 what we're what we're pitching for now, what we want to invest in now, is really going to infect the revenues in 26 and 27. So we 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 think we're in a, we're a good place. So you've raised a modest amount of money twice this year. Is this the preferred route for accessing capital? It would be. It would be if it was a little easier. Um, when we floated uh, in May 22, we asked the city to give us 10 million pounds. Um, they chose not to, which is their prerogative. Um, since then, we've had two further raises. We've, we've, we've now raised just over £9 million. Pounds. So we've still not raised uh, what we asked for at IPO, and we've delivered on our, all our numbers, and we've got a strong order book. We've got a pipeline, of, which is not an order book. We've got a strong order book, but our pipeline, which is, includes uh, items that are not orders, is $360 million. We, we've got a big opportunity, and we think... You know we are worthy of uh, the support of the city, which, yeah, to be fair, as a key number of people are supportive of us, and we're very grateful to those shareholders who who, who did invest, uh, have invested at all three rounds. Actually, um, we'd just like to see more of them. So I think the city is very mindful of the current economic cycle that we're going through. Interest rates still at fifteen-year highs, inflation stubborn uh, less so i just wonder how you are mitigating this economic cycle or whether the business is economic cycle agnostic no i i don't think we're agnostic we are affected we've noticed that some people are taking longer to make an investment decision but they are making the investment decision they're just elongating the process um it's it's important to know that we're we're unlike um a lot of the chip industry we're not making off the shelf chips. So we haven't suffered the destocking effect that was initiated by COVID because our customers design their own chips and they get made the, the volumes they want. So we haven't seen that tailing off in demand. Um, growth is good for us. So I, I don't think we're agnostic. You know, people are, people do affect, it does affect their decision as to whether they make an investment in a new chip. So there is, but we have not seen that. Per, in, in, corporately, we have not seen that yet, and I hope we don't. So arguably, you're a future tech entity. The company has been around since 2001. So I'm wondering, what does a future Ensilica look like? Well, 
the market generally is set to grow by eight to nine percent compound growth for the next six, seven, eight years. So clearly we have uh, an opportunity, just if we, we perform in line with the market, to improve our, uh, our revenues quite considerably. Um, however, we've got some specific uh, IP around satellite communications uh, and around healthcare, which we think will drive uh, revenues greater than that. So we see the next five years being a period of quite aggressive growth for the company. And hopefully uh, a re-rating of our, of our profitability and uh, an increasing market capitalization, which we think we can deliver on. So a lot to look forward to. Thank you very much indeed. Mark Hodgkins, Executive Chairman of Ensilica. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. It's been, uh, been good to talk. Thank you very much.